<laughs> All right. So, hello, everybody. Welcome to episode <laughs> 67 of, of uh, Spark Brian's T-shirt. Or yeah. Spire. Yeah. So, this is the Sparkcast, and that was a ultra su- super close up of, uh, of, of Brian's sweater. Yes. Yeah, showing that thread. Or, or yeah. Spire. Oh, I had to turn off my own volume because I didn't do that before. So we're going to have a nice little audio mix-up. Uh, it happens. So some uh, quick house cl- cleaning stuff. Um, we are starting a little bit earlier this week, as we will be in most future weeks. Uh, so we're going to be at 6 p.m. Eastern as opposed to 8 p.m. Eastern to better include more European members of the community. Um, awesome. Though next week, this is the caveat, which is funny, um, Zeefels, the guy who made uh, Ragnarok on Spark, he's going to be our guest next week, and he can't make it at 6 o'clock. We, he already committed to next week at 8 o'clock, so next week is going to be at the old time. That makes sense. Just to make this st- as complicated as possible. <laughs> Alright, so we have a major topic for the week, but is there anything that you'd like to uh, bring up and talk about real quick? Mm. Localization, anything like that? Yeah, just the fact that like um, we're really looking for community members to help us with localization of things that haven't been localized yet. So yeah, if you if if you haven't taken a look at, we have a, a forum post up about just sort of what we're looking for for people to help us uh, localize Project Spark in uh, other languages. We included basically every single piece of text that has not yet been localized. Um, and then a kind of in an Excel format, um, each of the different languages that you can that people can take a crack at, basically, um, to help us get it fully localized. Because unfortunately, we don't have the resources at this moment to fully localize it ourselves. All right, and like I said, the major topic of the week is going to be um, transitioning users from Project Spark creators into the game industry. Um, I think. That's a pretty broad topic because there are many positions in the game industry that people could move into. Real quick, um, I know every studio is different, but like generally, how at Microsoft would you say the uh, positions line up? Um, Positions can be generally segmented in four different, well, no, five different areas, and that's not including what Thomas and I do, which is which is the community management side of things, but actual like getting into game development itself kind of uh, five different areas so you have um, testers which testers are a really important part of um, of any game so you have uh, you always have a testing team that is made up of sometimes it's four people sometimes it's 300 people it kind of depends but uh, so you have a dedicated group of testers who kind of just I mean they, they test all everything um, you then have producers and the job of the producers is to basically wrangle and keep track of every single thing that's going on in the development cycle of a game and the producer makes sure that everything's on track that everyone is getting their work done on time that you know they they have what we call burn down charts of um, showing where people are to delivering you know the things they need to deliver on it's a great way to keep all artists and all designers and just sort of the entire team um, on point and making sure that everything's moving forward and also they are there for kind of giving estimates on how everything's moving forward so the producer is their they're one of the most important roles because they're the ones who keep the the trains running on tracks and running on time Uh, you then have the developers which um, the kind of engineers devs these are the ones who actually are building the engine. They're the ones who are building the um, the bones of the system through like a uh, programming language like C plus plus or C sharp or something. Exactly. Like that. Yep. Um, so Project Spark, for instance, we we use uh, C plus plus mostly. Um, a lot of other games will use C sharp. C sharp is um, C sharp and C plus plus are kind of the two most common languages. If you've ever built with Unity then you've probably maybe used uh, C-sharp or worked around C-sharp. If you've ever looked at Unreal, then you've probably looked at C++. So those are the two main um, program, programming languages, and that's what the developers kind of build stuff in. Then you have uh, the designers. and Well, actually, before designers, I guess I'll talk about the artists because the designers kind of take it from the artists. So you have artists, which are split up between... You have concept artists. Um, so these are the people who... Um, 
basically come up with the look and feel of um, different characters, scenes, settings, props. Then you have um, the actual 3D artists, and 3D artists are the ones who actually take those concepts and make models out of them. You also have, underneath artists, you have the animators, uh, so the animation artists who kind of take those models and animate them, bring them to life. And then you have the technical artists who um, kind of take those 3D models and, and do the more interesting tech aspects to them. A good example is um, for Project Spark, all, um, a few of our characters can use Connect. So our technical artists would go through and make sure that, you know, um, when you record your movements with Connect, that kind of works with the character rigs, things like that. Um, so then those, all those models are done, and then they're brought over to the designers. And the designers are the ones who bring it in game. So you have, uh, you have kind of the level designers, the ones who kind of create what the, the level looks like, what the space looks like. You know, if you are going through a Halo mission, uh, one, of the, one of the campaign missions, level designers are the ones who came up with the ideas of the progression through that level. Um, then you have kind of the environment artists who build stuff within that level to make it all pretty. Um, those are the environment arts are kind of mixed between design and, and art because you're sometimes you're building assets, sometimes you're taking finished assets and putting them in. Um, and then you have the kind of mechanics designers, the ones who are making stuff feel good. Um, you know, designers really they're the ones who take those 3D models, put them in game, and make it actually a thing. So um, sometimes you have 200 designers working on something. It's as you've probably been able to tell from everything I'm talking about, there's a lot of overlap between all the roles too, and that's, it's just um, something that is, that happens in the game industry is you have a lot of different people uh, will sometimes jump in and help in different aspects. It just depends on where you are in the game development process. And what you typically have is you'll have um, both artists and designers, they know how to transition through the development process because when you're building a game, you kind of start with prototyping, and then you then you get actually into putting it all in game, then put stitching it all together. And so, um, you know, people have to go through kind of different processes depending on where you are in a game's uh, life cycle. So, all these um, cross-discipline fields, they'll tend they tend to be a bit more experience-driven, whereas some others may be a little more uh, introduction level, uh, entry level positions. So. Mm -hmm. What would be a realistic expectation for somebody who has previously no um, game development experience, aside from Spark? Like, wh which ones could they walk into today, or apply for, and actually have a chance of getting? So, I'll kind of go through each of the five and talk about just some of the things that I know um, for just Team Dakota. Some of the things that that we looked at when looking at uh, people to fill the five different the roles in the kind of the five different spaces. Now, this is different. Um, team to team and um, studio to studio and platform to platform. So I'm just going to talk about how it was for us. It might be very different for others, but the the two points where I think you know you need the least amount of experience with just full game development are testers and producers. Testers, you have to have a, a lot of passion for playing games and for making games like for for. You have to be really organized as, as a good tester because you have to be the one to log bugs if, when you find bugs, to give really good repro steps, to, um, to you know, have a process in place for um, here are the things I'm going to hit on so you use your time efficiently because you, know, you, you think about a game like The Witcher, which has hundreds of hours of gameplay. How does a tester most efficiently use his time to make sure they're hitting on as many bug areas as they can? So um, testers really... Um, the thing that they look for most is a, a passion for gaming, and also um, just they they are um, they're organized. And an example of a uh, t person who broke into the industry, starting as a tester, was uh, Jeff Gee. Jeff Guy, yeah. Jeff Gee. <laughs> he, he said it's pronounced um, Gee, so I'm sticking with Gee. Yeah. So Je Jeff Guy was uh, he was our um, services producer. Um, he started out as a tester. One of the few, one of the, the first few games I know he tested was Cameo, um, and he was actually started out on the test team with Project Spark, but actually moved up to a producer to see to oversee all of our services. And now actually he is over at Destiny working on um, working on stuff there that I don't think I can talk about. 
But oh, he, um, he has talked. About, well, you can't talk about it, but he, but he has been posting a lot about Destiny. So I can yeah, he works. He works on Destiny on really cool stuff. Yeah. Um. Then yeah. So a lot of people. A lot of people. What they do is they start out in the test team, and then they they really they work really closely with with a lot of the teams. So they start to learn skills there. So the test team uh, is is a great place to start, but you need to be really organized, and it's hard work. You know, you you might think about. The fact that you're you're playing games all day, but it is really it is really hard work, and and there are people who are really good at, at testing, and, and people who um, who are not, and you'll you know the ones who are really good at testing and know how to use your time most efficiently, they're ones who are going to do best in kind of progressing through the industry. Right, because it's not just playing a game for the fun of it, right? You're testing uh, specific scenarios and keeping note of all of these scenarios. Like, you, you mm-hmm. wouldn't normally try to run up the side of a mountain when you're playing a game if you were if you had no thought that there was actually anything up there. But right. in a test case, you want to make sure you don't run through any walls. So it's, you're spending a lot of time running through walls or running through things that you ch- wouldn't expect to be able to run through or stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So you're not playing the game so much as you are testing everything that hits the position title. Yeah, that's that pretty much is it. And typically, test teams will also have... There's sort of like a daily checklist of here are all the things that our testing needs to test because um, on a daily basis with most games, the team is pushing out new builds and the new builds have like new stuff. And so the test team every single day has to go through this checklist of, of stuff to make sure that you know there's no huge game breaking things that were introduced in the most recent build. So um, you'll typically with the test team, the first kind of half your day is spent doing the exact same thing every single day. Um, so that's like something that you know, you have to think about getting into um, that there's a lot of repetition but repetitions are really important all right so moving on to the producer then the uh, yeah. entry level so the producer um, I would say testers like the best is the best place to start in the game industry uh, producer though you can get into the game industry as a producer without experience in the game industry um, before they will be looking for people who have been program managers or people who just manage teams or, or manage people's time. Um, just, you know, t- a tester needs to be organized. A producer needs to be uh, incredibly organized because producers are basically the people on um, development teams who keep everybody organized. So their organization needs to continue out to everybody else to make sure that kind of everybody is on track. And, you know, they're, they're the ones who are really keeping the teams together and making sure things are moving forward. So they're looking for, you know, when uh, a studio is looking for a producer, uh, and the starting producer positions are called associate producers, and that's kind of another great place to get into the industry, is uh, this associate producer role. And they're looking for people who are really organized and have shown, uh, have shown, can show past experiences where they have kind of managed teams and, and kept uh, people on track. And, you know, they are type A personalities do the best <laughs> in producer roles. And one of the other things I was told um, was, uh, for which, which, which of the producers of Project Park was, but they said, they said, you're not just a messenger as a producer. You have to come up with solutions for the problems as they arise. And not only that, but you tell the people and convince them that the solutions that have been come up with were even better than the original thing that came up before that there was a problem. Right. Like a good a good example is um, say we had say we have a pack coming out, uh, a new content pack coming out. Um, and the the team decides we need to ship this one week earlier. And so it's the role of the producer to look through kind of the whole the whole flow of things and figure out all right, if we need to ship this a week earlier, here are the things that um, that basically should be cut. Here are the things that are kind of highest risk to keep in. So these are things, therefore, that we should cut. And the producer is really the one that makes all the decisions on how we actually get to that point. So producers' roles become really stressful as it gets close to a release on, on a game because it's the producer's job to look at the flow of stuff and decide really what won't be able to make the final cut, and they're the ones who are—they're the ones who are going to give those recommendations to the team of this isn't looking like it's going to make the cut. Uh, so you know, I th- I think we should we should take this out, or sometimes you know I this really important thing isn't making the cut. I think you know 
the, that there should be a delay in releasing this. If those were the entry level positions, uh, reasonably that a person could get with only Project Spark experience and no game industry experience, um, what would be required to transition into like one of the artist or designer or um, developer positions? So for a developer position, you know, if you want to get in the game industry in a developer position, you really need to knowing uh, knowing K code is is great, but Unfortunately, K code isn't used for you know making actual uh, games in in the industry yet. Maybe one day, <laughs> but uh, you, so you need to show uh, you need to have just years of experience working with um, different coding languages. C sharp and C plus plus are the kind of the two main ones in the gaming industry. Uh, Python is sometimes used, not as frequently. I think with most most triple A games or most bigger games, it'll be kind of either C sharp or C plus plus. But it, it definitely can depend. So I think um, the most important thing they'll be looking for is, is proficiency with um, quite a few different um, programming languages. And, uh, you know, they... Whether they that do, be... Sorry, go ahead. Well, they, they do look for... Um, you know, this is, a, this is a space where it is good to have s some... Um, like, have you probably, it's great to have a portfolio of just things that you've made. So, um, you know, if you say you do have five years of C++ experience, but have only built stuff in Project Spark, you can show you kind of your coding prowess and even make a portfolio for, for that. And it's, portfolios aren't too, uh, it's not too often that you'll see a developer who has a portfolio, but uh, those are a definite plus, I'd say. So you want to get uh, programming experience to be a, a designer, whether it be through official schooling with a computer science degree or just self-taught as long as you have the experience and have learned it and have used it consistently over a period of time. Yeah, typically the things that will be in the job requirements for developer roles is X many years of C++ coding experience and X many years of C-sharp coding experience. And it will be something that in most roles, if you go to interview for it, they will actually give you, you know, on the spot, code this thing in C sharp or code this thing in C plus plus. So they they really are going to test your proficiency with that language. So it's not just something that you can say, oh sure, yeah, I've I've kind of off on and off learned it for the past three years. So I sh sure sure thing I can say of three years of experience because you'll find out it's uh, you'll have a lot of problems if you ever get into the interview process. And what about someone who were to be making their own games? Would that be count as uh, industry experience? Like, let's say that not only did they use mm -hmm. Project Spark, but yeah. they also um, used Unity to code their own, you know, Master Blaster remake. Yeah, and this gets more into designers and artists are the ones who, um, above all else, they need portfolios when when they're going for roles in the gaming industry, and for them, it's much more important that they show things they've built in the past or games they've worked on in the past, even if it's, whether it's a game in the industry or something they made themselves. So um, that's where, you know, just showing your experience working on other games, it's, uh, it's nice but not uh, crucial for developer positions, but it is pretty crucial for designer and artist positions where um, a portfolio is pretty much um, required for every role that you're applying for. So for that, that's an artist or a designer. So uh, you need to show uh, in form of videos or screenshots things that you have actually built. If you don't have any portfolio of things you've actually built, then um, you're going to have a really uh, pretty much impossible time of, of getting into the industry. So if, you, if you know, someone ever wants to go for the artist route or, or the designer route, that's where... Um, so that's where they they really look for, for both of those, having experience and knowledge of um, standard development tools, uh, you know, things like Maya, 3DS Max, knowledge of those, um, knowledge of game engines like Unity or Unreal or other game engines, um, and, you know, proficiency with those because you might jump between a lot of different software uh, in whatever role. So they're going to be looking at probably X many years of experience in these software tools, and then also a portfolio of things that um, that you've built in the past. And sometimes, especially so for artist positions, um, 
then a, a lot of times when you're applying for a role, they'll give you an art test. And um, the art test is usually, you know, it can be anything, but it's, you know, build this model for us in a week or uh, build an environment that looks like this for us in a week or, you know, do this thing. Basically, the art test is build this art piece for us to show um, how you can take our ideas and make things. Um, that's a really important part of the artist role. For designer roles, a lot of times they, you might have in the, in the industry designer test where they will uh, tell you, build this kind of quest in whatever game engine you want to, or, or build this concept, or you know, here's a concept, build it out for us, um, or write it out for us. That's less likely or less often than uh, the art tests, but it sometimes can happen too. So if somebody said, I'm really good at like taking ex established objects that would have been made by other people and then placing them into a 3D environment to make them look really pleasant and high quality. Um, is, is that enough or do they actually have to make, be able to make the assets all the time in order to get any position in the industry? If you're applying for an art role, you pretty much have to make the assets. Concept artists though, you know, they don't you need to be a really good painter and drawer to be a good concept artist. Um, but if you are going to be an artist that works with 3D art assets, then it's kind of a expectation that you know how to make 3D assets from scratch. So Designers you can't just say, can, I have an amazing level in Spark that shows how amazing stuff I can make. That's not going to be enough to say, yes, well, you can come work on our game. Probably not. That is definitely... Uh, it's definitely a plus to have it in your portfolio. A really beautiful looking level, say, in Project Spark. Um, it's a big plus to have that in your portfolio. Um, and, you know, things that show that th those things are, I'd say, more geared for designers. They're much more important because designers, you can get away with not knowing how to build art assets as a designer because um, oftentimes designers aren't building assets. They're just taking uh, finalized art and making a game out of it. So um, it'll be much more likely for a designer position that you know you can show amazing creations you've made in Project Spark, and and those are real, honest examples of um, that you know the industry will t will look at seriously of your talent. So what else would you need in addition to a Project Spark level to get a job as a designer? Like I like I was saying before, I think you um, need to have. So you need to have some experience of just, um, you know, a proficiency in other game engines. Oh, I thought that was developer. Sorry, um, I mean, no, de mind. developer, developer, you just need basically proficiency in programming, programming languages. languages. Gotcha. As a designer, you need proficiency in um, other game development platforms. Um, so, you know, it, it could be um, the CryEngine, it could be Unreal, it could be Unity, it could be, uh, you know, there's... There's plenty of other engines out there, but just showing, I think, uh, what usually helps is kind of showing that you have expertise in more than one also, because uh, just different games have, you know, you'll build things in different environments. So showing that you've been able to tackle more than one game development platform um, shows that you can kind of adapt to whatever is needed. And it seems like all these kind of bleed into one, each other, one another to some extent, aside from mm -hmm. like concept art, um, though that might overlap a bit with the actual uh, prop design. But does it uh, benefit somebody to be able to go after all of these to some extent, or do they have to be actually an expert in one of these fields? Could you be a, a mm -hmm. jack of all trades and a, and a master of none? If I would say if you want to be a jack of all trades and a master of none, you actually, you might have a better time looking at smaller studios and um, look at setting out your own path. I, I, if, if you want to go to say like a AAA studio, that's where you have, when you have teams of 700 people, then you need people to fit specific roles. And so that's where I think you'll find that if you really want to go into AAA game development, you need to be an expert in one certain thing. Um, and then once you're an expert in that one certain thing, then you know you have a better and better time of, of um, being hired for those bigger and bigger roles. But if you want to be the jack of all trades, the doer of all things, then um, look at smaller 
game development studios, you know, teams of 12 or so, um, or just start tinkering on your own. It's, it's so easy nowadays with most game engines being free for you to just tinker and see what, what comes of it. So I thought it might be, seem a little odd that we're talking about this instead of direct, direct, directly talking about what is in going on in Project Spark or other UGC. But going on from Project Spark to these professional either industry positions or working on your own in Unity or Unreal or what have you is actually something that's worthwhile for Project Spark. For you guys, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I mean, so you know, we see, I, we've seen um, some of our core creators have been able to take their knowledge, things they learned from Project Spark, and apply that to full development uh, software like Unity or Unreal, and that's a huge win for us. I mean, that's like that's awesome. That shows that we did, we did instill something in you. We we taught you something that um, you will be able to really use in your life and. You know, you hopefully got inspired to, to make games through um, having the, the more easy in approach that Project Spark has. Um, because I think without Project Spark as, as a primer, if you don't know where to start, if you open up something like an advanced software piece like, uh, like Unreal Engine, you're going to be really, really intimidated because you're it's a completely blank canvas. It's not just in Project Spark, you start at an empty world, start from scratch. And you already have a character, you already have a world, you already have a uh, easy access programming language, and you have thousands of assets you can use. When you start with something like Unity, you start with a test dummy and um, a ability to run. <laughs> and then you have to program everything else yourself and create every other asset yourself. Or find it somewhere on the internet that allows you to either buy it or just take it for free. The Unity yeah, store does that true. For stuff, but that's true. Not mm -hmm. too much, not relative. But I'm not sure. Actually, I would be talking about my uh, ear if I was talking about how much free stuff was available to Unity because I'm not aware relative to how much was available in Project Spark. Well, this so it's it's kind of different. Um, Unity, you you're not going to find too much free stuff because you'll have a lot of people. You know, Unity's a real game development, like a really full game development platform where. Uh, you make money off your um, off your creations, and so uh, a lot of you'll have a lot of people creating props or assets that you can purchase. So that so you won't find many free ones, but you'll find a lot of people who've made a lot of things that you can purchase um, to use. I, I would say though, um, kind of going back into like say you have been playing around with Project Spark for the past year, and you're like, what like you know what. What else is out there? Like, what? How will how will I do if I try and approach something like a like a full game development, uh, like one of those professional platforms? What will that look like to me? And what we have seen um, with talking with lots of people is you'll you'll still have to start from the beginning with the kind of the execution of things. As in, you're going to have to new, learn a new programming language. You're going to have to learn these new tools. But the thing that we've seen that Project Spark teaches you, if you were to go on to um, a like really professional tool, is it teaches you the logic aspect that I think is missing from so many people who try and make their games. Is the Project Spark gives you the idea of all right? Here's the here are the actual things that. I need to achieve and accomplish in order to make this game. And that's something where um, it, it's one of the most crucial steps for you to actually be able to make a game. And we've seen people really benefit from kind of being able to take that knowledge. And because of that, they learn the tools and they learn how to make big things so much faster. I'd say like 10 times faster than someone else who just starts and goes directly into there with no previous knowledge. And even if someone were to go into a, a career in producing their own games through Unreal, Unity, what have you, there's actually still value in them using Project Spark. Mm -hmm. For like a, a really good example is I remember talking with um, one of the guys who developed Ori in the Blind Forest, which um, is you know awesome. And he um, 
so Moose, you were there with me uh, last year at Comic Con when we talked with them, and I ran into again him again this year at um, GDC, and he was telling me about how sometimes he'll have an idea, and he prototypes it in Project Spark and plays around with it because you know you can prototype ideas so much faster in Project Spark and iterate on them and like really get a good feel for something you want to do. Um, and we've seen a lot of professional developers, designers use Project Spark in that way, even even when they move on to other things. And so that's like that's that's awesome that like they they see you know you have a really professional design designer and they see that our tools much easier for them to use to come up with their ideas. Right, because it already has the established uh, physics engine, it has the lighting, it has you know. Uh, a lot of the assets and, and the codes has a lot of shortcuts because of the attack tile that would be like a few hundred lines of code or you know if, at least a, more than one one uh, word so they get to cut to the chase of sorts and see would this be fun to use is this a fun concept and I also think the point that Mescad brings up in chat is um, is is a great example also of that you know, learning how to make something in Project Spark also really helps you. Like it teaches you how to take those really big problems that you're having and break them up into smaller, solvable chunks. So you have this this huge problem of I want to make a randomly generating city, and you know, with by spending time in Project Spark, you now know how to approach. Like, all right, first I need to work on this thing, and then work on this thing, and then you know, put these twenty pieces together, and then I'll have my randomly generating city. Right. It's becomes a list of tasks rather than just an overall question mark. Mm -hmm. Oh, there was one thing I wanted to ask um, before we uh, branched away from the p professions of the industry, but I guess out of order is better than not asking it at all. Oh yeah, totally. Um, so there were physicians, obviously the lead physicians like programmer, design lead, test lead, etc. That those are like the straight up professions. Uh, progressions of this of those uh, career fields, mm -hmm. but what about something like a creative director? How would somebody just write the lore of a game or write the text of, that goes along inside of Champions Quest? Like, how does somebody get there? So I think you get there by by wearing a lot of hats in in games. So by being kind of the visionary behind a game, you have to have great writing. Um, you have to have a good deal of experience and you have to find the kind of the right opportunities for you to grow into that role. So um, our creative director for most of Spark's lifetime was Henry Cerchi, who he's now over working on Minecraft. And he, um, he kind of got his start in the industry actually writing um, reviews of games like as, as, a, as a really young professional. And you know he was the things he was writing about games were so spot on that people that people started to take notice, and that's how he got into the industry. And you know he kind of evolved from there and, and went from one role to the next role, and you know is now in a creative director position on um, a lot of different games here at Microsoft. So would be would uh, simply being a good writer be able to let you transition into being a creative director? Like say you wrote your own novels or your own concepts for what video games could be, like the storylines and backstories and setting up the you know the characters? It definitely helps. I mean, I would say probably the, the thing that helps you get into a creative director role the most is being the one who you're in, you're in a studio and you're the one who says, this is what we need to do for our next game. Here's the lore. So you're, you're the one who basically pitches the idea for the next the next game that your studio makes. That is kind of the way that you evolve into the creative directors. You're the one who's coming up with the like the full ideas for here's what we need to do next. Well that sounds easy. They'll hire me the next time, right? <laughs> Typically you need you know you need you need to be in a studio for, for a while. You need to build your, your credibility and your reliability and you need to kind of um, I mean a lot of times it's it's luck and good timing of just being in that position to be the one to chart for, chart the way forward for the next thing that your studio makes. 
uh, it just shocks me that no creative director has come forth with the idea of cats and bacon, the game, because everybody loves both those things on the internet. Uh, that's true. I, you know, you probably might find cats and bacon on the app store somewhere. I wouldn't be surprised if someone made cats and bacon the game somewhere. It just never rose to popularity, unfortunately. It just clearly didn't have uh, enough marketing, I guess. Or maybe it was on a platform like the Xbox One and uh, Windows 8. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so do you have any uh, final thoughts as far as like what you would like to suggest to uh, Spark users who were interested in pursuing if going or transitioning from uh, Project Spark with their new experiences there towards a full career? Um, I, I would say if you feel, if you're really interested in making your own games, like your own professional full games, and you're intimidated about where to start, if you have an idea for a game, the best thing to do is start by building it in Project Spark. And go through the hurdles there and you know use that to understand how to make your game. And then you're going to answer all the toughest questions about, about your game. You aren't, you're not going to feel as intimidated at that point. And then you can look at you know, one, of the other, one of the other engines. I mean, I am very comfortable by recommending to everybody who's an aspiring game uh, developer to download other development platforms. Download something like Unity or Unreal, which are both free, um, and just play around with them. You know, they may seem intimidating at first, but you start to get more and more used to them. There's great, you know, they have great tutorials out there that'll kind of help you, help you get more and more used to them. And you're gonna, you know, the intimidating things, um, a lot of those you'll have solutions for them by prototyping out stuff in, in Project Spark. And really the biggest hurdle, honestly, I say anyone runs into when they move to professional tool is assets, props, people, things that are moving in your world. That's probably the, the most daunting thing. So that is the one thing that um, I think I don't think anyone out there has has solved that for like for full professional development tools. I think like that's that's why Project Spark feels so great because you have all of these assets you can already use. But if you're moving on to something like you know some full development kit, you have no assets to use. So you're either gonna have to make your own or um, or purchase some. So uh, yeah, that is yeah. up to you what route you want to go. But and for uh, those who thought that like five dollars for an owl was expensive. Wait until you see how much they're charging for one character that's made out of 8-bit pixels. Yes. It'd be like $15 yeah. or so. Yeah, I remember seeing just one zombie character with uh, three walking animations was $75 um, in, uh, I, think it was, I think it was Unity. Uh, and that's, that's kind of standard because, you know, it's, it was um, high quality and it did those animations it took, well. It took a lot of time to make them, and time is money, so they want to be compensated for their effort. Yeah, Swift, Swift Arrow CZ, um, his, his point is very valid. It, it, learning to make games, to be able to work in the industry, you know, if you go the traditional route, it takes about it takes about five years. Um, so Spark you, has only been in beta since uh, right. two years, so... So, but that's if you want to, if you want to land a, a substantial job in the industry, you know, that's what, that's how long it takes. So consider, you know, you, if you really want to take this seriously, you will have to um, invest the time in it. And it's, um, honestly, it's not, it's not an easy path. Um, the, the game industry is a really, it's a really hard industry to get into, uh, really, really hard to get into. And it's uh, you work really hard on things as well but the payoff at the end um, I have you know I have a few friends um, I now I have quite a few friends in the industry but I have a few friends who worked on Halo 5 um, and I saw them last night and you know for them the amount of pride they felt that you know Halo 5 has shipped it's out there in millions and millions of people's hands they're all playing it they're enjoying the thing that I built in there it's um, that's you know one of the most that's the reward that it was 
all worth it. All that learning and all that um, and all that time working on the game is is worth it. It's one of the most one of the most uh, you know one of the happiest things uh, is when you when you get to ship something and you see everyone everyone loving it. Yeah, uh, you know they say uh, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life because nobody's hiring. No, um, <laughs> but if this is what you want to do, it's going to take work because there's a lot of other people out there who want to do the same thing and they're also willing to do the work. So, yeah. and not only that, but game development is a cross-discipline. Uh, uh, what's what was I going to say? Cross-discipline. Uh, career field something like that anyway so there's a lot of different uh talents that have to go into it like when you think about it game development embodies all of the artistic genres whether it be sound music uh visuals and even uh story writing most times it's it is every piece of liberal arts basically which is what it's that's what attracted me to game development because i I was like, when I was growing up, I was like, oh, I want to be a movie director. No, I want to be a writer. No, I want to be, you know, an artist. Um, and I couldn't, uh, no, I want to make music. And I couldn't figure out which one. And then it was uh, sometime in college when I like saw this little game development kit. And like I realized when I was putting stuff together, it's was like, whoa, this is everything I enjoy doing. And, oh, uh, sorry, another thing that, like, another... Um, Another like suggestion I'd make to people in in uh, making stuff from Project Spark is so Project Spark has a it has a very large community. Um, I know maybe some people don't frequent the forums that much, but the community is very large, um, and the community is not is not dying down. That's that's awesome thing. Like every and every there's it's a large substantial community, and um, things are going well. But what that means for you is you have a lot of people who are making things in Project Spark, and a lot of people who probably are aspiring game designers and game developers. This goes to the the second point that Swift Arrow CZ made is uh, you know meet people, and Project Spark is the best way to I'd say meet other aspiring game developers and come together and come up with great ideas and then make a team and you know go off and and build something in another engine. Uh, you have all these people who are brilliant at at what they do. That you have, you know, you can you have access to through the forums or you know through in-game uh, messaging or through what have you. You have, you know, it's like a huge roster of people who, if you have the kind of the same idea as them, then you can really start hitting it off. I can think of three uh, teams of people off the top of my head who have already moved on, well, not moved on so much as also branched out to uh, Unity or Unreal, that met through Project Spark. Mm hmm So. It is a viable option. And speaking of viable options, the uh, next game jam is coming. And that's, that's <laughs> yeah, a, that's a great way to test your metal with uh, other in teams. Um, we're gonna yes, we're gonna announce the next game jam pretty soon. Everyone who's listening here, um, just keep keep an eye out because it's this is gonna be a really cool one. I think we have some some uh, unique prizes, some things that. Um, like something that hasn't that hasn't been done before, which uh, I'm excited about. Um, and it's we are going to allow people to be in teams, so we're not gonna. I'm not gonna tell you obviously now what the what the game jam is about, so you start making stuff. Um, but you can, you know, if you want to, you can start coming up with teams of people who you might want to collaborate with on making uh, an entry. But uh, more is gonna come out on that very soon. Uh, yeah, we're excited about this game jam. Game jams have just been a wonderful way to get great creations out of Project Spark. You look at the top twenty-five games that we that came out since uh, launch, and I think ten of those top twenty-five that we had at least were from a game jam. Yeah, and that wasn't even including some of the like better creations that were made for uh, game jams that just didn't make that top twenty-five list. Like yeah, the second community, the second game jam, the one that that org ran. It was like overflowing with amazing things. Like even Bob only made your honorable mentions list, and I thought that could have been easily a top ten. It was really good, but there was lots of competition. <laughs> and uh, Swift made another point: uh, your first few team projects will likely fail, and failure is not a bad thing, especially it's when you're first learning. Thing. It's honestly um, just you know having having 
talked in the game industry with lots of people. It's it's one of the most important things when you're interviewing for a position is actually knowing failure is like is a wonderful thing. It's something that can't be taught. So um, failing is actually you're gonna feel bad about yourself because your your wonderful idea failed, but it is it is so much better for you in the long run. Um, you just learn so much from it. You you know you grow from failure. So uh, yes, probably the first few game products you work on might be failures, but that's a good, that's a good thing in the long run. Right, because if you're working on a game and you take too long, you try to cram every little detail into it without prioritization, and you end up with a game that's non-functional but has really nice. At, uh, um, aspects to it, that's a failure. But you learned a whole heck of a lot from it, especially not only how to make the really cool things you made, but how to actually scope the project to actually be something that's completed at some point, rather than an ever going until it just runs out of funds or time. Right. The thing, the thing that I see the most often that happens with people's uh, first few game projects is games that are. I see a lot of people. Most projects, uh, their first project is a great idea. But hardly any people's first project is actually a fun game, because that's one, that's one of the things that um, it really can't be taught is how to make a game fun. Um, so you know that's that's just something to keep in mind if if you do want to branch out on your own is the fun aspect is the most important part of your game. If it doesn't matter how good the story is, how innovative it is, if it's not actually fun, no one is going to like the game. They'll play it for a few seconds, well, a few minutes, maybe a few if you're lucky a few hours and then decide I don't want to do this anymore and the problem is like with reviews and stuff like that if somebody turns it off and they say I didn't enjoy this they'll probably go and review it negatively and that'll negatively impact everybody else who comes afterwards mm -hmm. oh fun thing about uh, um, reviews also if you're plan on doing uh, your game on t putting the game on the steam and you use the steam green light um, and not steam green light uh, early access, the reviews from early access never go away. So if your game is buggy when you go into early access and people yep. downvote it because it's upvote and downvote on there and we know how we feel about that, um, those downvotes will never go away. So even if your game comes out amazing after it's released, it'll still be at best a mixed or slightly positive as opposed to overwhelmingly positive, which is what's needed to actually get sorted by preference and see a lot of people see a lot more people um, that could be potential players yeah I mean I'll be I'll be honest about that is that something that project spark ran into because it had a long open beta and there were obviously bugs in beta so um, we have we still have lots of reviews from people early on in beta who you know they came in they found bugs and things were running slow and you know the UI was a was a mess when we first launched and they didn't come back because it that was their first experience with it. So and, you know, another thing is you only launch once. Uh, I think I mean a lot of game developers have kind of said that quote before, but it's it is really important is when whenever you kind of launch a game, you can only launch once. So it better be it better be a good one um, because you know you only have one chance. Right. Um, I forget which uh, developer it was that said this, but they said the the people won't remember if it's late. They'll only remember if it's great. Yes. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have said that. Um, I think like the one I'm thinking of is Shuhei Yoshida. That sounds right. Um, and I know it was actually said in reference to Diablo 3. I think Diablo 3 at one point was getting a, a delay. But mm -hmm. the funny thing about that is it, it could have used another year in the oven. But um, the, the thing about development is it has to come out sometime and sometime it just has to do with come down to money to when it has to come out. So yep. that's the other thing. Uh, it's going to hurt when things go bad in the game industry because it's something that if it's something you care about, and yeah, you have to be released it's... early, or if something doesn't go right. Yes, another thing that um, people, I mean, people in the Project Spark community have learned this uh, when yeah we used to have ratings, but the one the other thing that you just have to prepare yourself for is there will be people who won't like your game, and it will. It'll it'll feel bad to you when when you see those reviews from people who who call you know who say your game is horrible and you know what were the developers thinking when they made this and you will feel it will make you feel bad but you know it's it's an important thing to get through and just remember 
that you you made this still and it's it's out there and for you know there's 10 bad reviews for every one good review people are more likely to complain than they are to praise or say oh it was it was okay so you have a lot so even if you are seeing only bad things there are still people out there who are enjoying it right because it's not about how many people dislike your game it's about how many people do like your game because no matter right. what genre you make there are going to be people who don't like that genre who don't like that art style or who don't like that gameplay mechanic and there's gonna be other people that do um and i don't think any game out there has been universally praised by everybody and bought by every single person on the planet so um, i mean you think about like destiny for instance that launched and got pretty mediocre reviews lots of people were like oh this is not you know this is not what we were promised but it's like the biggest game uh you know one year later it's still the biggest game uh out there I didn't realize it was uh, that big. I didn't. Is it bigger than WoW? Uh, I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah. Oh, well, that's. What is it like? Seven million people play WoW. Last I checked. Hmm. Well, at least that's. I'm pretty. Only... I'm pretty sure. Uh, I think I remember a news report of at least, like, twenty million. I think I remember of people playing Destiny. I, I forget what the stats were, but I just know it's it's a lot and it has staying power. Oh yeah, uh, my brother's sorely addicted to it even mm -hmm. though he doesn't have time or bandwidth to play it he will play it yep all right so i think we have exhausted that topic though we can probably always come back to it later if anybody has any questions uh i'd be happy to pass along to brian and then he can uh get give it his best go and yeah. if, if somebody were to uh produce something inside of like another game engine and then maybe, or if they wanted to apply for a position in the game industry, would you be willing to uh, get a recommendation? Depending on if you knew yeah, them or not. Yeah, I mean, if, yeah, if, if they reach out to me, uh, or not just me, but you know, Thomas or I, or, or um, someone else on on Project Spark, and you know, we, we we're not going to give a recommendation to somebody just because they have built something in Spark. We want to kind of know who the person is, but um, we're you know we're more than happy if if it's a if it's a great creator to give our recommendation that they have built great things in Spark and, you know, we think they can use that to continue to build great things in the entire game industry. And I would be remiss if we didn't mention this one last position. What does it take to be a community manager in the game development industry if someone decides to go that route? <laughs> um, it takes a lot of objectivity. Um, a lot of objectivity. Because so typically with most games the community manager is the face of um of that game and they're the ones who firsthand deal with anybody really negative towards the game and so if um i'd say the community manager has one of the kind of the hardest esteem roles i'd say not obviously the hardest working roles because you know you have developers and designers who are working 18 hour days to get things done on time but they have the, um, the, the roles that take the, the greatest amount of, of esteem and objectivity because even when things look the worst, they have to remain cool, calm, objective, and like really understand the problems that the community is facing. So um, I think when, when uh, you know, we're looking for someone to be on the community management team in the game industry, we're looking for somebody who has a very good character that can deal with, with all of that. Um, and also someone who's just you know a great communicator. That's that's always obviously uh, really important. And um, they love the game that they want to be uh, a part of because you know they need to understand it as much as their community does. So they need to have like a, a good a good grasp of it. Uh, and the last thing is you know um, I think community managers um, have to kind of think outside the box with uh, with little budget. Uh, so if they are people who can kind of think outside the box and think of cool new things to do, um, that's always a, a plus. And of course, uh, familiarity with all the social media, um, being able to make uh, spark episodes, or being able to write tutorials, that, those are also pluses. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it depends. Like with Project Spark, we, both Thomas and I, obviously, the fact that we both uh, knew it really well and were good at giving education things it was really important for this. But you know, educational aspect, or understanding the educational aspect, is not as important for other games. What do you mean? You don't need to tell people how to program in Halo Forge, or? 
Well, actually, but the the uh, 343 Industries has some cool stuff about how to make things in Forge. So um, they, they, they have that. Could you elaborate oh. on that more so I could mute my Yeah, dog? well, I think people... Um, People are talking, asking about this thing in the corner here. This is actually, this is a floor lamp, and for some reason, we decided to draw googly eyes on it. I don't know why. <laughs> it's it's kind of weird, and we think it's kind of funny, um, and I don't know why we haven't moved it yet. <laughs> you haven't moved it, so we can be a guest on the Sparkcast. We can interview That's true. it. That's great. Yeah, so it's... <laughs> it's not a tower of ghosts. It is one floor lamp that looks like a ghost. Oh, so I uh, missed that uh, question from Mescad because I didn't understand it at the time because we were talking about destiny. I'm like, what's he, a reference to ghosts? Because ghosts <laughs> are like also an um, element inside of destiny where there are little droids that follow you around. Um, yep. But anyway, so real quick... Um, the other thing that has been going on is we, sp we briefly mentioned tutorials. Uh, you guys have been working on tutorials uh, for on the YouTubes? Yeah. We just pushed out something about sine waves yesterday, probably something not many people knew about. Um, what we So in the tutorial, what we show is not technically a sine wave, but it's the Project Sparkified version of a sine wave because you don't have to – sine waves have kind of – it's a complex uh, – formula to get a sine wave and you can you only need to use like two of those pieces of info to make to make a sine wave and spark but still it's really cool i that's like that's what i'm, I'm most proud of is um, most recently is the tutorial on sine waves so why would somebody want to make a sine wave is that like the, the live long and prosper sign and then you wave with somebody with it um no it's it's uh it's basically um giving you like smooth movement um it's like it just using sine waves for anything that's moving or turning or rolling or pitching or, or yawing um, or orbiting uh, just makes things look so much better. So it's a smooth transition, basically, of sorts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you guys are doing a lot more of those tutorials? Yes. Yeah, so we're going to, I think we're keeping up with doing, um, with publishing about two per week. And then on, in the meantime, Thomas and I are also working on a larger tutorial series that we haven't published anything from it yet because it's it's uh, going to be you know a lot of videos uploaded at once. That one's probably still quite a few weeks away for, for us to get enough content together to feel good about pushing it up because we want to bring people all the way from the very first time they launched Spark up to making their first game in Spark. And, uh, like, so do you have a um, tease as far as like, what the topic of that might be? Like, is it a first-person shooter? Is it a... It is, um, well, that's, the, I guess the tease is um, we're leaving it up to you. We're, we're going to actually have a bunch of different modules. So you go through and you get to choose what first game you want to make, whether you want to make a first-person shooter, RPG, um, I think platformer, uh, I think we have like a few others. So you, you get a choice, basically. Um, and then we'll walk you through to the tutorials on kind of all the basic mechanics of that. So it's kind of like a choose-your-own-adventure, but more of a choose-your-own-adventure game. Maker. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, that it's too bad that that didn't exist like you know two years ago. Well, you, you, the, I guess the benefit of not releasing, um, we don't have any more content packs coming out. So the benefit of that is um, it frees up more time to focus on things like education. Finally. Sure. All right. I think that's about it. Unless there's one other thing in the most recent um, a state of spark. Uh, next game jam. Oh, Spark Share. Yeah. Um, so, so Psycho Killer, the community member, um, they have a beta release of their app, Spark Share, which allows you to share assemblies um, and you know other things with uh, with other Project Spark people. You need to have Project Spark on Windows, but it's really it's really cool. It's uh, they basically made this interface that you can share stuff without actually having to launch uh, Project Spark. So you can like make things in Project Spark, you don't have to share it in Project Spark, you can instead share it there. So it like, makes it easy to share files between friends or um, you know, without launching Project Spark, you can just see the kind of best of assemblies and download those and, and go into your game so you don't have to use up, you know, say you don't have to use up upload slots, uh, sharing assemblies. Um, so it's, it's a, other way that people can share content with each other 
we've uh, we've been working with Psychic Killer to make sure that you know it doesn't it's not breaking any terms of service, uh, and it's not, and uh, it's really great. And Team Dakota gives it a thumbs up. I guess two thumbs up. And four if Tom would, Thomas would come in to frame. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right, so thanks again, everybody, for watching. Uh, thanks, Tom, uh, Brian, for joining us and giving us his insights into the game industry. Um, we will be back next week at 8 p.m. Eastern, shifting back to the old time, so we can uh, accommodate uh, Zephals to be on as a guest. Yeah. And then, presumably, all weeks after that, we'd be back to um, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern each week. Um and if anybody would like to be on the Sparkcast in the future, uh, any week other than next week, um, feel free to drop myself or Brian or Thomas a line, and then we can figure it out. And I will get to one question that's kind of code-based. Um, I'm wondering, if you want your character to kill as many enemies as possible, which sensor would you use? I would actually look at um, a look at all enemies that are within a distance of one meter of me, and those are the ones that I damage. That's what I do. So I'd look at something things within one meter of me or however many meters of me. So I would not use a sensor, I'd use distance. And look at everything within that distance. So yeah, what I was thinking was maybe he meant by sensor, by meant he wanted to count how many enemies that character had killed. So how many? How would you keep track of how many enemies that character had killed? Oh, if you want to do that, then uh, what you want to do is have a global number variable called enemies killed. And every time uh, you put this inside of each enemy that uh, just win... Uh, w once win is dead, or it's like win once is dead. Uh, do this number variable called enemies killed increment by one, and that means like every time that enemy dies, it increases that number variable by one, and then you can collect all that to know how many enemies you killed. Good deal. And the final thing, uh, the final notes, Mescad mentions daylight savings time ends on uh, this Saturday, I believe. Sunday. Oh yes, for us U.S. citizens, that's right. It's different in other countries. So we will be losing an oh no, gaining an hour of sleep. We'll that's right. Repeating an hour, and also this Saturday is uh, Halloween. So happy Halloween, everybody. That's right. Yes. And we're gonna go ahead and end the stream here. Everybody have a happy Halloween. Be safe. Have fun. And live long and prosper. And live long and prosper. Yes. <laughs> Later. Bye.